what I've, I've always wondered this, you know, cause I, I messaged you, I think it was like two, three, four weeks ago and talked about how for me, like coming from, I was previously an evangelical Christian, uh, five, mm-hmm. six, whatever years ago. And I went through a period of transitioning away from that where I just like despised worship music, despised the Bible, despised so much of it to now having like a deep love and respect for it as with many other religions in the world and really a deep and profound, like never before when I was a quote Christian love for Jesus Christ and the person that he is. And I listened to a lot of the old worship music that I used to listen to now from a different lens. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because you said that some of that fits into your meditation and prayer practice that, that you have. Um, what is your meditation and prayer practice? As much as you want to share, because I know some people keep that personal. Uh, I've always been interested to know what you do, what your routine is on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Yeah, man, this is something that's been, has evolved so much. Um, I have my meditation altar. I have a, it's a meditating Christ. You got that the other day, right? Yeah. It's rad. And I love that because for me, it's so symbolic of the spiritual journey I've taken where I began with Christianity, which um, the way I would classify it is that Christianity leans heavily to the feminine side of the spiritual spectrum, meaning it's very love and devotion based. Mm -hmm. It's all about love, surrender, and devotion to God. But... um, Whereas the masculine side of the spectrum is like wisdom, philosophy, understanding, comprehension, clarity. And so what Christianity does really well with the bhakti, devotion and love, it really lacks in the masculine side of wisdom and theology, right? I mean, Christianity's theology, they have almost nothing correct. Like it's almost all completely garbled. But they have the love and devotion. So there's a real aspect of truth there that brings people to Christianity and gives them something real, right? They connect with God in their heart, and they feel the oneness, they feel the unity. And then the pastor says, but you're separate and you're damned for hell if you don't confess this and that. And they're like, oh, wow, that's not the God I just experienced, but okay. And that was like my the, whole the, life. The difference between the, the New Testament version of God versus the Old Testament version of God, I could never <laughs> exactly. wrap my head around that, man. It was just two completely different beings. It's absolutely Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Mm. And uh, so I went to the Eastern side of things, heavy into Buddhism, uh, Dzogchen, Zen Buddhism, really heavy, heavily into Hinduism, Advaita Vedanta, Taoism, got so engrossed in that because it gave me what I always lacked, which was the wisdom and the understanding of the divine, the understanding of unity and oneness of consciousness and all of this. But after a while, something in me became so empty and it was like, I understood so much truth, but I still felt there was some kind of void in me. And I realized I had forgotten my original spiritual practice, which was love and devotion to God, like just connecting with God and love. I don't need to understand you or know what your nature is like and the philosophies. I just love you and I want to experience you. And that was 23 years of my life. So I really took a turn and went back to that and started listening to worship music again. Um, I started um, practicing actual bhakti yoga. And these were the things I did as a kid where I was just always connecting with God in my heart. And I started connecting with God again in my heart. And so I really sort of married the two, the masculine and the feminine, the wisdom and the love. And today my practice really reflects that where I spend, um, you know, 40 to 60 minutes typically in two different sessions um, meditating. And then I also spent, I mean, I I can't go a day without worship music. My soul craves it. As soon as I put it on, I'm I'm connected. Um, And that translates to my every experience of life. I I experience God in nature, in other people, in all kinds of experiences. And so I think the real magic happens when we marry the love and the wisdom together together. Whereas most people just look for one, typically the wisdom in spirituality. They want to know concepts and truth, which absolutely has its place. But all that wisdom is serving, is supposed to be serving you back to love, to understand the nature of love. And love is reality, right? Knowledge can only point you to love. 
point you to reality, but the experience of reality is love. And I think so much of what people are missing in modern day spirituality is that aspect, right? Is connecting with God. The experience of God is love. So that's why I love law of one so much because it really compels you to get beyond yourself. And it's like, get out and love people, serve people, be kind, do a service to others act that your ego might not want to do. Right. Yeah. But when you do that, you experience God in reality. And it's like, without that, all of our spiritual dogmas and concepts and lectures are just like mental masturbation. Yeah. Like for what good is it serving you if we don't love people? So the service to others component with the meditation and contemplation and studying for me has been the sort of the magic recipe. Dude, I love that because I resonate with it so much because for me, it's been really much of the same, right? And I think just kind of like the law of one did, you just verbalized <laughs> what I had been experiencing because I could never really put my thumb on like, what is it about like me reconnecting with the Christian roots that I had that you know, I thought it was all bad. Now I realize there is elements of good and elements of it that I yeah. need. Right. And yeah, you know, the other piece of this is I have, like I said, such a deep and profound love for the person that was Jesus Christ. Um, mm -hmm. What has that experience been like for you? And how do you view Jesus in your current frame of, of being? Yeah. Well, that's a really cool topic for me because I only understood Jesus once I got out of the Christian paradigm. And that's why I think it's so important for Christians to do that. Well, Christians who are questioning the dogmas and are looking for a more expanded view of Christ, you've got to get into some other religions and start doing some other studies mm -hmm. because there's just one truth. So you don't need to be afraid of what angle someone's looking at the truth from because if they want the truth, if their heart is pure, they will see the truth from whatever unique cultural historic angle and sort of like different cultures, right? We love going to Greece and having Greek food and going to Latin America and having Latin food and, and then Alabama and Louisiana and having country food and stuff. All the cultures are beautiful and delicious. To me, religion is just like that. It's like I love squeezing the juice out of every religion and the way that they see the divine and that they approach self-realization. And so it was through studying the masters of the East, of French sages and Yanis and the Hindu and Tibetan traditions and understanding what it means to be self-realized, it was such a huge epiphany. I was like, oh, now I understand Jesus. Yeah. He was a self-realized being but he was stuck in a very monotheistic culture, right? Where, I mean, if he had to be very, very subtle about the way he put his oneness experience, and he even then wasn't very subtle about it. But, you know, I and my father are one. That's as close as he knew he could get to saying, I've realized I am that. Because if he had said anything directly enough, he for sure would have been killed much, much sooner. And I think he knew he had some work to do in the world, so he wanted to keep his ministry going for a while. But he knew absolutely that he was going to be eventually executed for what he taught. So it was only a matter of time of like, how much time do I have to reveal this oneness and help get this consciousness moving forward? Because it was so stuck, right? In that kind of Middle Eastern um, part of the world where it's just all the Abrahamic faith going to war with each other and killing one another because they have a very separative view of the divine. God is kind of some monarchical boss up in the sky who's very temperamental. And if you don't follow all of his rules, he's coming to kick some ass. And so Jesus is like, how do I show this culture who firmly believes that this is how God, what God is like? How do I possibly explain to them what oneness is and unity consciousness? So all he could really do was be that and embody it. And people could for lack of a better analogy, smell that fragrance coming off of him. And they didn't understand it, right? His disciples had really no clue what he was talking about. And this is the reason he shrouded everything in parables, right? Almost everything he ever taught was in a story form. And almost every question he gets asked, he responds with another question or tells a parable. He never dished out answers plainly, almost ever. How cool is and that so, though? Because he's like, by asking questions back, 
or responding to a question with another question, he's putting it back on that person to find the answer within themselves, which is what a exactly. true master does. Yes. He would say, whoever has an ear to hear, let him listen. Meaning there's a deeper truth to what I'm saying. And if you have the spiritual capacity, you'll understand what I'm really saying. Everyone else is like, what, what was the tale about the scattering seeds and the soil? I didn't get that. Right? So that was the point is that he didn't want them to get it because they weren't ready for it. But the ones who were ready for it, something in them would burn inside and go, this man has the words of truth. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what his disciples said to him when I can't remember which part of the gospel it is, but Oh, it's when the, they come to stone him and then all the people uh, leave him saying, this teaching is too hard. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. This guy's a cannibal. We're out of here. Everyone leaves him. And then his 12 disciples are left standing there. And he's like, well, all the other thousands of followers have left. Are you guys going to ditch me too? And they just kind of look around and go, I mean, where are we going to go, Lord? You alone have the words of truth. But they didn't understand what the truth was but they felt it. Right. Yeah. And so that's why I think religion, religious symbols and um, archetypes like the Christ, the resurrection, the crucifixion, um, uh, communion, all of these rituals and symbols. I think we need them for that reason, because divine truth has so many layers to it and it's so incredibly deep. It's like fractal. Like it goes in on itself forever. There's no real end point to it. And so we can't possibly capture it in words plainly. Like Christ knew he couldn't, right? Yeah. We need archetypes and stories and um, symbols to represent these truths. Like the Christ, right? The Christ represents that light of awareness, that light of consciousness within all living beings. And Jesus, the man, realized Christ, the consciousness within himself. And he pointed to that in everyone who would listen to him. And so I think we need these symbols, which is why, like you, I came back to them and saw them in a much different light, a much more exalted light, where it's like, these aren't stupid stories and myths people made up, but they actually carry such profound spiritual depth that we can plumb for lifetimes, right? We can come back to these stories and find new, new truths in them. It's been such a cool experience. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jim McCarthy and uh, Carla Rucker were both uh, Christians, right? Carla was very much a Christian. I'm not totally sure if Jim was, but I think he was. Okay. And that's cool because, like, that just shows that, like, with a few tweaks uh, of the, the central, I guess, or the accepted – view or overarching view of Christianity today with a few tweaks of that Christianity very much is aligned with the law of one and, and the way what Ra puts forth on how to be a loving being in this reality. Oh yes. That's also why I love a course in miracles so much because it uses all those Christian terms, salvation, atonement, the Christ, the father, Holy spirit, and it uses them to point to non-dual realities. Mm. And it's like, oh, this is how we can see these truths and words and symbols to that point beyond themselves to a much deeper transcendent spiritual reality. Um, they're not to be thrown out, right? They have an incredible meaning and depth that we can, we can utilize them for that purpose. And uh, that's the reason any religion hangs around on the planet for any period of time. It's because it contains real truth. Every religion at the core is the same truth, right? All is the one. And from there, as time goes on, it gets delineated and distorted a bit, but you can always find that core of truth in all religions. Yeah, dude, this is a perfect segue in my last two questions, actually. <laughs> so um, these are the questions that I ask all my guests this season, <clears throat> and you're going to hit a grand slam on this one. So. <laughs> What is the purpose of life? Why are we here? Mm. It's a meaty one. I would say at this point in my experience of life, we are here to know ourselves. That's it. it at that. so, dude, yeah. that's perfect. That's all you really need to say too. That's good. <laughs> 
<laughs> I Anything else that. I say is just going to murder it. So <laughs> yeah, no, that's That was perfect. That was perfect. Um, I knew you'd kill that one. So <laughs> in a good way. Not like, mur- yeah, you know what I mean? Um, so this last one, this is a hypothetical because it would never happen with any person that I view, but, or I interview, this would never happen, but hypothetical. If you had two to five minutes to share an unfiltered, unedited message that was to be shared with the world on all mainstream news platforms, and it would be viewed by everyone, what would you say? You're put on the spot two to five minutes. You want to actually do it for two minutes? Whatever you, like, whatever you would say, if you, like, like a mainstream news reporter came up to you and was like, what message right. do you have to share with the world that's going to be viewed by everyone? Right. Well, I would, I would definitely spend that time talking about oneness and unity and how it's the only way to get anywhere we want to go. Um, and it would probably sound a lot like what we, the whole monologue I went on earlier, which is like, you have to understand the nature of energy. Mm. If you approach someone with the same energy, you enhance them in that sense. Like if someone's angry at me and I get angry at them, what happens? They get even more angry and then I get even more angry. So it's like, we have to understand that only love and kindness depolarizes what we call evil. And we have to start seeing evil as people who are working through imbalances and distortions and personal issues. Like I love this uh, line from the course that says, be kind always for everyone is fighting a difficult battle. Mm. So it's like everybody wants to scapegoat and hate the racist, but nobody wants to ask how he became a racist. Mm. Nobody wants to talk about and look into how he was indoctrinated or brainwashed by someone else as a child to see these people a certain way. It's like everything is passed down from generation to generation. And until we start seeing that and start seeing people and souls and beings rather than labels, we're just going to keep creating this insane world. So the, the truth of oneness is what I would always spend my time talking about if I could. Boom, dude, that was good. Aaron, thank you, brother, for joining me. Um, it's always a pleasure talking with you, man.